I would hope not. I would like to think I follow in the tradition of Spinoza and Leibniz that there is an explanation for everything. As Spinoza and Leibniz were great believers in the principle of sufficient reason. There must be, for every, death, uh, for every unambiguously observable effect there must be a proper observable cause or some correlation that you can establish at the very least. Uh, and Einstein too every now and then would Im uh, invoke the principle of sufficient reason. So. I'm an optimist in, in that respect, but I would think I, I would think it's probably a, an infinite process that, that it won't explanation will not come to an end. And in fact, I, I'm inclined to think that science as we know it at the moment is as yet only scratching the surface of things, that there's a much richer and deeper science out there yet to be discovered where in some senses one could understand things like the creations of Mozart and Beethoven um, and, and the paintings, why, why Cezanne spends a year deciding whether to put a bit of green here or there you know, perhaps there is some really deep explanation for that, which which would be to do with the totality of of the universe in in some very profound holistic sense. Potentially capable of being explained, and then then there's another there's another issue of I mean I think a huge issue in this is is the nature of consciousness what is consciousness now um, Spinoza said uh, God is nature nature is God we are part of nature so that means we are part let's call it part of the divine or the sacred or, 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 or something like that I mean I'm not uh, I'm certainly not a conventional Christian in, in believing in Christian dogma or anything like that. Um, but still the universe is an extraordinarily wonderful place. Uh, and so then, now I'm, I would slightly change Descartes' cogito ergo sum. Uh, I'm aware, I'm part of the universe, therefore the universe is aware of itself. The universe is self-aware. And where is all that self-awareness? Now maybe it, it seems to us that it's located in, in me, but Leibniz says that we're all, we're monads, we are sentient beings, and we're each different views of the universe seen from our particular perspective. This seems to me a very very exciting prospect, but he insists that the universe is infinite and he talks about all sorts of attributes of the universe that we cannot really get hold of because they're too subtle. He has a wonderful metaphor of waves breaking on, on, a, on the beach. We're, we're in the distance and we can just hear that sort of noise of the waves, but we can't see the, we can't reconstruct the individual waves. Of course now with modern electronics we could analyze the, the Fourier uh, transform and we might even actually be able to get a picture of, of the waves breaking on the shore without being there, but just from the recording of the noise. Um, and in fact this is exactly what is happening with radio astronomy. They're picking up the minutest amounts of energy and they're constructing these absolutely fantastic pictures of the distant galaxies. Now, um, and one always seems to think of this that, that one is looking at the universe from one point of view. Now maybe the universe itself is looking at itself from all different sort of points of view and it's all correlated. So I see possibilities of, of a tremendous amount of richness out there. Well, I don't know what it is because that's a theory which uh, is yet to be found. I, I do, from very direct experience, know what it is for me to be self-aware. Uh, also, I know that things come to me from outside. I mean, the, the, the poets, all, many of the poets would insist that they did not create their poems 
they were just the conduit, the channel through which something came out into the world. And that's certainly the case, all my experience of any of the good ideas that I've had, to the extent that I've had any, they weren't there and then suddenly they were there. It was not my conscious self that created them, they came up into my conscious self. When, uh, when I was writing my first book, it was a fantastic experience. I used to get up in the morning and say, I wonder what I will have written by the end of the day. And I would have no idea what would come before the end of the day. So it was always a very exciting experience. Um, so this is also why I don't believe in the Turing test that a computer will ever do this because the computer by definition is a closed system and it's designed even if they put in vast amounts of information so that it can try and give a sensible answer. The human being is an open system. It, I, I believe at the most fundamental level I think the universe is, very, is, is utterly holistic and I'm part of this holistic thing. So I think, it's, I think this is why the human being will always come up with surprises which a computer would be incapable of just because humans have constructed it so that it can't do that. It's perfectly possible, I think, to have what I would call timeless explanation. About, when was it, in 1988-1989, that's not in the past, that's in a different place in the configuration space. Uh, it was when the universe had a different shape. Um, Lee Smolin and I developed a math well it was mainly Lee's work, developed a mathematical model of Leibniz's monadology. I won't say it's a complete perfect model, but I think it goes a very long way to uh, implement in precise mathematical terms what Leibniz was saying. Now Leibniz is laughed at for saying we live in the best of all possible worlds and Condide said this is the best, what are the others like? Um, but the he didn't actually say that. If you read his monadology and you get to paragraph 57 of the monadology he says that we live in the most varied of all possible worlds created by the simplest possible rules. Now that is something which you can formulate precisely and Smolin and I did do that and there's one or two papers, we, we never actually got one to a joint paper in a journal but the one by me is called On the Deep and Suggestive Principles of Leibniz in Philosophy which is on my website and that shows that you can have explanation without something happening in terms of time, in terms of initial conditions and it is actually explained in terms of shapes. You can say why one particular shape of the universe would be realized. The, the, the law is that it must be the most varied shape that the universe can have and that is capable of precise mathematical definition. So this is explanation in terms of shape and I believe that actually shape is, is is, is the ultimate thing by, by which we understand the universe and explain it. Science, I would say that theoretical physics began with the Greeks when they tried to understand what they saw in the heavens with the planets moving. And if you think about it, when you open your eyes at night and you look up at the sky, you see a shape. You see how the stars, there's just angles, between the stars and then there are the planets and the moon and the sun if it if it would if you could see that if you're out in space you could see the stars as well as the sun at the same time you just see what you see on the sky so I, I take that the angles are, are the are part of the ultimate reality that you have to have them to, to do science and then each each possible distribution of stars and planets on the sky is a shape of the sky and Astronomy and the laws of planetary motion could be found. Astronomy got off the ground because most of all of the stars stayed fixed relative to each other. So that was a visible background with respect to which they could track the motion of the planets, the moon and the sun. And then, fantastic bit of luck, 
the earth rotates or the stars rotated and that provided the clock. They could never have found the laws of planetary motion without there was only one single clock available for two and a half millennia that could be used to do make the astronomical discoveries. And that too is the change in the sky because the stars move over the sky. I stand here, I see the stars move over the sky and basically if I look one day and then the following night, I will see that the planets have typically moved about a degree against relative to those stars. And so we have the stars relative to the surface of the Earth. It's all done in terms of the shapes of what I see. Um, so that's why I believe that explanation is done in terms of that. So now in time, all you're really doing is taking, as it were, a whole sort of snapshots of, and this is in fact what the, the ancient astronomers did. I mean, the Babylonians were very good at keeping records of what the sky looked like, and if you look in Ptolemy's Almagest, written in 150 AD, he is using, to test and confirm his theories, he's using records of observations made 800 years earlier in Babylon. And that's essentially, the, in, in, in written form, it's snapshots of the sky. So all of that explanation comes from comparing shapes. So that's for me the fundamental, so, so in that sense you've sort of got a causality, um, but now you see everything in a way is Everything is, 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 the past is a, is, is a retrodiction from the present, it's a hypothesis based on correlations in the present. This was how the geologists discovered deep time. They, they, uh, 200 years ago people thought that the world was 6,000 years old because they believed in, in the account in Genesis and somebody had counted back the generations of, of the Old Testament patriarchs and things like that. But then they started, geologists started looking carefully at rocks and fossils and they found correlations. And then they said, how could those correlations have occurred? If there's correlations, they need an explanation. There must be a sufficient reason why they're there. And bit by bit they concluded that the Earth must be vastly more ancient than people had thought. And in fact they were much closer to the truth than the physicist, Lord Kelvin, who had no idea about nuclear, nuclear processes keeping the sun going. Um, and all of that data on which deep time was discovered is essentially still there. It hasn't changed because it's in static form, in, 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 it's, it's fossils and rocks. So you can still go back and see where Darwin and his professor saw the evidence for glaciation in, in, in North Wales. The, 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 the marks on the rocks and the shape of the valleys are still there. Um, so it's, I would say all of science is done in the present by comparing shapes, looking at correlations. Um, and causality, of course, it seems that the law, well there are these K on decays, which I think you can still also understand in some sense, because CPT, the CPT theorem in, in quantum field theory is still not challenged. So I think there is a, a sense in which really if you uh, do the time inversion as well, you, 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 you get, I think, it's, it seems to me that you still get a sort of time symmetry, uh, which is very profound. So, uh, I think it's very misleading to talk about initial conditions of the universe. You shouldn't say that at all, because even within classical physics, all that's happening is that information is being, by, the laws of physics are changing the structure of the universe from one shape to another shape. And then, thanks to the very low entropy of the universe, somehow or other the shapes that we have now are, have got sort of information in them that we say, well they've evolved from this relatively simple and homogeneous structure into the past and, and we can predict that it's going to get even more inhomogeneous in the future. But in fact we're, we're going in both directions, the, the information is here. Now that's all at the level of classical physics, I think quantum mechanics is opening up a much bigger field and a much richer and more exciting field for explanation.